This is a podcast about one woman's mission to help entrepreneurs and business owners write better business books. Each week, we tackle your writing excuses, because there are excuses too, and help you beat the blank page of doom so that you can write the book that will grow your life and your business. Now, here's your host, Vicky Fraser. Hello, and welcome to The 1000 Authors Show. I'm Vicky Quinn Fraser, and today... I'm really excited because I have had the opportunity to interview Joanna Penn, who is owner of The Creative Pen. She has written more than 30 books, loads of fiction books. Um, She writes uh, thrillers. And also she has written a lot of nonfiction books as well. And I have been following Joanna ever since I first started out uh, doing what I do uh, because she is superb. She has an enormous wealth of knowledge about the indie publishing world and self-publishing. Um, and she has you know, made a really successful business out of writing fiction and non-fiction and helping authors to um, create businesses for themselves. So I am, I was really excited to get in touch with Joanna and I was really chuffed when she agreed to come on the show and talk to me. And I think you're going to really enjoy our conversation. Um, dig into where she came from, um, what she, what got her started doing what she does, and found out all sorts of interesting things about her. She's had a very interesting um, journey to get where she is, and she's done all manner of interesting things, which is shouldn't be too surprising because the best writers, you know, go seek out interesting things and then write about them. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy this interview, and I will see you later. Joanna Penn, thank you so much for joining us on the 1000 Authors Show. How are you doing? Oh, I'm good. Well, thanks for having me, Vicky. It's great to be here. Um, Okay, so there's so many things that I want to ask you, um, but I'm going to start with the question that I always start with, which is, what are you reading right now? Which I find an odd question because I am... I'm always reading a ton of different things. (laughs) I just don't have one book. I mean, I'm surrounded here in my office. I I read so much for my book research. And so I've got maybe 25 different books on my desk that are (laughs) like physical books. Uh, But in terms, but I I went to look for one novel. So I'm novel wise, I'm reading Girl One by Sarah Flannery Murphy, which is a mystery thriller about sisters and virgin birth. And that's quite cool. So that's a, a, a thriller, I suppose. And and then nonfiction, the book that is by my bed right now is called The Anthropology of Turquoise, Reflections on Desert, Sea, Sand and Stone by Ellen Meloy. And uh, that's just a lovely memoir, sort of travel memoir. And um, I'm writing a travel memoir as well as a thriller. So <laughs> I, tend wow. to, I tend to just read all over the shop, which, you know, a tip for listeners is if you read all over the shop, you will write all over the shop. And that is a mixed blessing. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh yeah that's such that's such a good tip and I, lo- I love the fact that you're reading so many books because that makes me feel better about myself so <laughs> um, I, I just I can't help it you know I, it's probably well especially in a pandemic you can't go anywhere so I just spent all my money on books <laughs> yeah yeah same <laughs> Um, okay, so I'm I'm pretty sure that people who are listening to this will, will know who you are, but just very briefly, can, before I go on to my first kind of tell me your life story question, um, can you just t- tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Yeah, sure. So as Joanna Penn, I write nonfiction, uh, mainly for authors. I have a podcast, the Creative Pen podcast, which is, is super old now. It's been running since 2009. And uh, and I, I used to speak don't much anymore. Uh, I also write thrillers and dark fantasy and crime as J.F. Pen, and I have another podcast called Books and Travel, which is around the sort of insights into travel and interviewing people about the travels behind their books. And uh, because, as I said, I'm writing a travel memoir, and uh, so it's kind of a, a new direction. But yeah, so I basically I've got around what 33 books or something at this point, and I left my job a decade ago, as, as probably as this goes out. Actually, it's uh, around a decade since I left my job. I used to implement a accounts payable into large corporates. So (laughs) I think a decade as a creative entrepreneur means that I know a couple of things, but I'm still learning. And I love this uh, indie world because there's always something new to learn. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So let's, let's dive straight into that then, because that sounds, 
like you came from the accounts payable corporate world. Um, what's your story? You know, where do you where do you come from? How did you get to where you are? And um, you can go back as far as you want because I'm I'm like super interested in people's life stories. So, <laughs> uh, well, we'll we'll keep it centered around writing. I mean, I I did. I have a master's in theology, which uh, appears a lot in my fiction, although I'm not a Christian. Uh, but essentially, after Oxford, I went to Oxford, you get recruited into various companies. And I got recruited into a consultancy firm called uh, Accenture, or back then it was Anderson Consulting. And basically, day one, they said, everyone on the left hand side of the room, you're going off to do this software package called SAP. And I was on that side of the room. And that was basically what I did for 13 years on and off, <laughs> is I went and, and sort of did that so I'm not an accountant as such but I worked in finance in financial department implementing IT but it was I fell into it and I think this is so common for many people you you don't think you made a conscious decision to do anything in particular and then the years go by and um, uh, I was sort of in my mid-30s by then I was living in Australia and I was like how how am I here how am I sort of still doing this job when I swore it was just to pay my debt off after university and just definitely like needed to change my life. I was super miserable. I had the mortgage, had the pension, had the investments, had all the things you're meant to have. And I just wasn't happy. Uh, so that's when so 2006, I started writing my first nonfiction book and uh, 2009 started writing fiction and blogging and podcasting and all that and just just took steps towards changing my life and took a number of years uh, but I, I guess I, I managed to do that and uh, the only other thing I'd say is I, I had a number of other business failures along the way and I think this is important too it wasn't like oh here's my job and now I'm gonna be a full-time author uh, I started a scuba diving business when I was living in New Zealand I did um, property investment I had some other sort of fledgling things in the early days of of internet and yeah and sort of found my way into this when the technology allowed it which is another big deal you know you can't run a business you couldn't have run a business like this when I left college in the 90s that just wasn't possible so yeah all of those things kind of came together I guess okay I'm gonna just go go back I've been um scribbling a couple of notes but I'm just gonna go back to your theology degree because I'm fascinated by the fact that you decided to do a degree in theology and then kind of ended up in accounts payable and then you know moved into writing can you can you talk me through that journey because that's that's really interesting uh, well, I actually I actually went to Oxford to do Arabic because oh. I worked out in um, the West Bank of Israel uh, with this Palestinian charities and did a lot of work in my teens with, um, you know, sort of all the things you get into in your teens, trying to change the world, yeah. trying to bring peace to the Middle East and all of that. So I went to Oxford to do Arabic, but swiftly discovered that it was super, super hard <laughs> and that most of the people on my class in my class already spoke Arabic and I didn't and so I went to my college and said do you have anything else <laughs> they said well because uh, I did uh, ancient Greek at GCSE uh, which is for anyone who's not British a sort of 16 to 18 um, age group I know it was 14 to 16 wasn't it? anyway I had this Greek GCSE and uh, so I was like yeah sure I can do ancient Greek I can do the Bible in Greek I can I and I've always been interested in spirituality and um, and but I ended up specializing in psychology of religion which is uh, and in fact my protagonist in my arcane series Morgan Sierra is a psychologist specializing in religion so I put all of that in my fiction now but um, so it was kind of again trying to do certain things and then changing direction and this is a metaphor I use a lot which is your life is a bit more like a, a ski slope <laughs> than than anything else in that you you're going you're heading in a direction but you don't go in a straight line or oh, it's it's all gonna end quite soon <laughs> you kind of zigzag to different things and uh, although I am a planner I have I guess also just taken opportunities as they arise uh, as they have arisen and um, it made it up as I've gone along <laughs> But that's kind of how I ended up there. But it wasn't, I didn't choose theology. It was a kind of what happened. But as it's turned out, uh, it was a great degree because it's his, it's history, it's language, it's philosophy, it's ethics, it's all of these different things and travel too. I mean, all my novels are based, uh, there's a lot of churches and really interesting ecclesiastical uh, architecture and all of that. So, you know, what we are ends up in our books, I think. 
Yeah, for sure. Um, well, thank you for thank you for sharing that. And I, yeah, I can I can see how that would be just so much fodder for for the fiction books that you write. Um, so coming back to books, then, what got you started? How did you get from how did you get from the big corporate world to writing fiction? I know that you've had a lot of kind of entrepreneurial adventures along the way, but what what got you started in writing nonfiction? Where where did that come from? Well, I, I'm, I've always been a good student. <laughs> I like, and as I said, we said at the beginning, I'm surrounded by books. And so my natural inclination, if I need something, is to read. I've always been a huge reader. So around sort of 2005, uh, I was 30 in 2005. So I had my 30th birthday. And you know, you have that, those big birthdays, you sort of question what the hell's going on in your life. <laughs> And uh, as I said, I was miserable in the job. So I started reading a lot of self-help, a lot of American, you know, Tony Robbins and Jack Canfield and and all of those writers. It was listening to what were then... (laughs) tapes or um early days of mp3 players when you had a tape that you would put in your car and then a sort of adapter you would plug into some pre-ipod device yeah, I love those. <laughs> yeah exactly so i was listening to these things i was reading the self-help stuff and i was like do you know what i think i need to in order to process all this i, I need to write it all down i need to write all these notes and and i thought oh i'll just write a self-help book because i need help and so i my first book was called how to enjoy your job or find a new one and it was all about essentially career change and in 2012 actually you know this you do a lot of coaching with non-fiction authors but um it was it's much better to title your non-fiction book with keywords (laughs) so when i retitled it career change it sold a lot more copies which was good but originally it was a kind of how on earth do i change my life and but it just happened to be at the time when tim ferris put out the four hour work week Gary Vaynerchuk put out his first one whatever that was called and there was quite a movement of these sort of career change books in those days when blogging and internet marketing was starting to really take off and so I wrote that book and in the process of writing it I looked at the traditional publishing industry in Australia and was kind of horrified Mm -hmm. (laughs) to discover that if I tried to find an agent and a publisher and all of this uh well apart from the fact that you're not meant to write the book with non-fiction you're meant to pitch a you know proposal (laughs) I was like but I've already got a book and I thought well if it's going to take two years screw that I can do that myself so I did and went down that indie route in the process of publishing and then learning about marketing I discovered and then I I started a blog about what I was learning because I got ripped off and I fell in all the things that people get wrong. And, uh, you know, even things like marketing, you know, I I did press releases. I got on national TV in Australia and I sold like 100 books. Mm -hmm. So I put everything I learned into the Creative Pen, my website. And essentially, then my next books were sort of on what I learned. And again, you've done this. I mean, a lot of us do. If we learn something, we then want to help other people. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what started it, really. Cool. And I just want to like, I want to point people towards your nonfiction books right now, because when I first headed down this route myself, your books were an enormous help to me. And like, I've got them all on my shelf. I refer to them often. So thank you for, thank you for writing them because it was just fab to find um, a, a, a woman writing about this kind of thing. Cause I'm big on women's voices and all the rest of it, but also just somebody who has actually been there and done that themselves, like right from the beginning. Cause you were really, you know, really early. You came up really early in the, in the publishing world, didn't you? You were there pretty much at the beginning. It sounds like. So I, I, how how did you find how did you find that as like a pioneer of, of you know, <laughs> well it's funny it's so funny you say that because of course people always indie published I mean uh, Virginia Woolf ran her own um imprint <laughs> I mean Walt Whitman uh published his books I mean all, artists have always put their books out there what I was around for I guess was the beginning of the digital era for um, independent authors and so I I self-published before print on demand and before the kindle (laughs) and before digital audio (laughs) so I guess what's changed is the way technology has enabled our career and I guess I definitely credit a lot of it to being in Australia 
uh, where books are incredibly expensive. I mean, here in the UK, books is, print books are super cheap. Mm-hmm. Like they're really, really cheap. And so the UK has been behind probably three to five years behind America and uh, Australia in, in many ways around digital. So I was living in Australia. I desperately wanted more books. You know, I can read a book in a, in a couple of hours. And so I was spending so much money on books. And so when they announced the Kindle, I was one of the first people in Australia to get it. I had it on pre-order for as long as possible. And when it arrived, there's still a video on YouTube with me going, this is going to change our lives. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and also print on demand. It was uh, Amazon bought Create Space, which then became KDP Print and, and all of this. It, w- it was just in that time. So it was a sort of confluence of, of energies. Um, so in terms of what it was like, it was really exciting and I was essentially talking to these American indies this was I mean people don't even really remember now Amanda Hocking and John Locke and people who were you know making um, or even um, Joe Comrath J.A. Comrath who you know early days of people putting their whole backlists onto Kindle, Bella Andre, Barbara Freethy, who, uh, you know, suddenly were emancipated from this old way of working. A lot of them romance authors and genres that hadn't been accepted so much in the in the traditional uh, publishing world, I guess. So it was super, super exciting on one hand. And on the other hand, it was sort of dispiriting because I'd only just started writing. So I didn't have this back- backlist. I didn't have the confidence as a writer and so it really has. So that was 2006 I started, 2008, eight, nine, and then 10 was when the Kindle, International Kindle launched, or it was 2007 when the iPhone and the Kindle launched internationally. And uh, as I said, I left my job in 2011. So it really was sort of five years of writing and um, publishing and learning and blogging and podcasting. And it was early days of Twitter and Facebook as well. So it was the whole world changed at that point. And I think because I'm quite a sort of futurist thinking person, and also I I have no patience, I'm just like, okay, I'll do it. (laughs) I'm quite happy to fail. Uh, I jumped in all of this stuff uh, as soon as I could. I mean, literally as soon as I could, way too early in many cases. Uh, And yeah, I guess I've just kept doing that. And I love it. I love the freedom, the creative freedom. I love the experimentation, the fact that we get to, we don't have to ask anyone's permission to do anything. It's like, oh, this new market's opened up. Uh, I can publish in China through Publish Drive. Yes, I'll do that. (laughs) Upload a book, you know, that kind of thing. And that has meant a very exciting 15 years, unbelievably. And I think the next 15 will be even more exciting. Okay, so where do you see where do you see the next fifteen years going in terms of, of publishing and books? <laughs> well, fifteen years is a very long time. I mean, clearly yeah, the next couple of years. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I do, I do um, on my own podcast. I have futurist episodes. If people are interested, if you go to thecreativepen.com forward slash future, mm-hmm. I link everything there. But I just did one on the metaverse and Web three point oh. Uh, which will be in the next couple of years, you know, moving into VR, AR, blockchain, uh, all this type of stuff is coming. But in terms of immediate immediate things, <laughs> then um, realistically, it's, it's going to be more of the subscription model, um, which will mean that indie authors will move into much more direct sales. And then also bigger ticket items like bundles and special print runs and nfts and i mean you know non-fiction authors are good at this but fiction authors less so in terms of building other products and courses and events and things around their primary intellectual property and i think that's going to become more and more necessary as it has done for musicians like we can always see the future in what happens with music and looking at what they're doing right now very much it's okay sure streaming on spotify you could say streaming on amazon slash audible uh, is one part of my income but the rest of it comes from direct relationships to fans through patreon through nfts through you know director fan merchandise and all this other stuff so I think we're moving into perhaps even more of an era of the author entrepreneur which I know some authors don't want but hey that's what traditional publishing is for (laughs) Uh, go license your books if you don't want to do it yourself Um, but for those of us who really enjoy learning things and putting stuff out there in the world then yeah super time yeah so it's going to be really interesting to to see 
the industry change over the next couple of years, I think. Um, how, how do you think the traditional publishing industry is going to, because have you ever been traditionally published? You ha- you've always been just indie published, haven't you? You've always been solely focused on indie publishing. Uh, yeah, I've got foreign rights deals. So mm-hmm. I license my books in other languages, but uh, I've never, well, I, I had an agent a while back, um, but it was just the amount of time that things took uh you know something like she had one of my novels for maybe six months and towards the end it was like oh this this people might be interested and these people might be interested and I was like "Eh, no I'm gonna self-publish before Christmas so and you know you have to you have to decide what you want to spend your energy on and if you're going to traditionally publish then the energy is submission which the word itself is ridiculous uh it's you know it's rejection it's doing what people tell you to do um I mean sure some authors get a ton of money and they love their publisher and their agent and they have an amazing time but I haven't met many of those (laughs) so I I love the creative freedom and the ability to write what I want when I want publish what I want and as I said make decisions around my work my intellectual property when new opportunities arise um, rather than like signing a contract for everything all rights existing now and to be created which is or to be invented which is a very common contract clause so I I definitely sign rights deals, but it has to be a decent contract. And they, you know, they're, they're not that common these days, especially in fiction. Nonfiction is different, as you know, but fiction, yeah. OK, so speaking of fiction, um, what what led you to start writing fiction um, from, from nonfiction? Was that something that you'd always wanted to do? Uh, no, not really. It was mainly on a podcast. Uh, one of my guests, Tom Evans, said that I probably had a block around writing fiction (laughs) because I said something like um you know because I went to Oxford and my mum taught English and I'd always been raised to think that uh the only book you should try and write is some sort of Pulitzer Prize winning or Booker Prize winning (laughs) literary fiction (laughs) and although I read literary fiction I, I enjoy literary fiction I when I was miserable in my job that I was at the time, I was reading thrillers and action adventure. And I've always loved sort of Wilbur Smith and, um, you know, those Clive Cussler and uh, those types of books and James Bond movies and Indiana Jones and Lara Croft and all of that. So I was like, I, I'll write action adventure thrillers with a female protagonist like Lara Croft, uh, like Indiana Jones kind of thing, strong women doing action adventure. Um, and so I did that first. 20,000 words in NaNoWriMo in 2009. Mm -hmm. And if people don't know, that's National Novel Writing Month in November. And it's a very good way to get started because it has a lot of education, but also inspires you to just have a go. (laughs) So I did that and then spent the next sort of 18 months going through the writing and editing process. And I got, got the bug, really. So I've written 17 fiction works across of um, novels and some novellas and also some short stories and things like that and yeah so and I like it because it's a very different side of me JF Penn is quite different to Joanna Penn and and so I like having both in my life so I didn't know that I wanted to write fiction but I'm very happy I do yeah that's so, it's so cool that's a that's that is a, that's a lot of novels I'm a bit boggled by that I just think that's really cool um, and I also love the fact that I love the fact that somebody kind of prompted you to, th- to think a little bit differently about fiction as well, because the idea of kind of s- setting out to write a Pulitzer Prize winning novel, I can't imagine anything more daunting or impossible to do. Exactly. <laughs> and, and I think a lot of people probably have, have a similar idea because it's just, oh, I couldn't possibly write fiction because I, you know, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not James Joyce or whatever. But but I, I love that approach. And I love the fact that you have kind of, you've got this attitude of, oh, I'm just going to try it. And if it doesn't work out, then then that's cool. And, and at least I've tried it. Is that an approach that you, that, that seems to be an approach that you've taken to all of your business and, and kind of your life and your travels, really? Is that something that's carried through in everything? Uh, perhaps not my marriage. I mean, <laughs> <Well>. <laughs> it's, work, it's worked out. This is my second marriage. Uh, but it's, yeah, I mean, I guess I think I'm not afraid to give things a go and uh, I'm not afraid to learn. I think that's the main thing. If people want to be a successful independent author, particularly, or, you know, I mean, you're an uh, author and a 
podcaster and technical things like website stuff or learning how to do an interview like this. You have to learn this stuff and writing a book, you have to learn how to do it. And, and if I was looking at your website and, you know, you say, sure, you're a ghostwriter, but most nonfiction writers can write their own book. <laughs> <laughs> and but the thing is they don't until they learn how to do it but it seems like some people are resistant to learning how to do things you know I get so many emails every day well how do I self-publish it which is why I have a book called successful self-publishing which is a free ebook <laughs> <laughs> I get so many questions I'm like please just go read this it's got everything you need um and but it's like you can find this you can find out anything now I mean the the problem is not information it's deciding what where you want to go and I think what I've found along the way is yeah sure I've let a lot of things go I've made a lot of mistakes I mean even that first book like I said I rewrote it and republished it in 2012 as career change it's still there I'm thinking about maybe doing a 10th anniversary edition in 2022 but there are so many other books I want to write <laughs> But, you know, and then um, when audio, digital audio started, I just hired a studio and went and narrated an audio book. And uh, very early, like 2014, I, I did got into translations and um, some of those were epic failures. Like the translations was way too early. I did German translations in 2014 before the Kindle took off in Germany. And now it's going great guns as we do this in 2021. A lot of indies are getting into uh, translation on the German store. And I I do have some again now, but, you know, that was early and it cost me, but by trying these different things, some work out and some don't. So podcasting, starting a podcast in 2009 has very much worked out for me. Whereas that translation example in 2014 did not, <laughs> or another epic fail, starting a scuba diving business. <laughs> don't do that people. <laughs> Okay, so that sounds like the beginning of a story. What, why, why do we not start a scuba diving business? Well, I mean, the reason being an author is so good is because the costs are very low. <laughs> you, <laughs> yes. you do need a computer at some point, but you can write with a pencil and some paper. You know, it's really super cheap and it's free to publish. Yes, you should budget for editors and cover design and all that. But essentially, you can do a lot by bootstrapping. Whereas if you want to run a scuba diving business, I was in New Zealand at the time, you need a boat, <laughs> you need fuel, you need insurance, you need proper marketing to get custom, physical customers. You know, there's, yeah. there's so many issues with running a physical business, you know, let alone the weather that can scupper the whole thing. And um, I mean, of course, the pandemic has proven the business model of digital first global uh, business model. I can't imagine. I mean, I feel very bad for people who've been running a physical business or trying to in the last 18 months. So, yeah, I'm, I, but I think the, the mistakes I made with those early businesses have led to this business working very well because I know what I want. And what I want is to run a business from my laptop, which I do <laughs> with very, very low overheads and very high profit margins. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Thank you for that. Um, I'm just going to steer back to a question that I, I want to ask now for most, mostly for my own um, selfish purposes, because I don't write fiction. I have many, 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 many beginnings of short stories that languish and I just have not got into it. So I wanted to ask you, because you write both, how do you approach each type of writing and how different is it? Well, I would say... I would say part your problem, part of your problem, but I have friends who are like you, uh, extremely experienced at writing nonfiction. And the problem is when you're an expert in one area is you think you are going to be that good in another area. <laughs> so you are clearly a very good writer and you do all this ghost writing and all this, your own writing and things. But what that means is your expectations are super high <laughs> for your fiction. So I imagine you look at these words on the page for fiction and go oh my goodness that is a pile of crap <laughs> yeah is, is that about right <laughs> yeah a lot of the time yeah yeah <laughs> yeah and 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 the reason why is because you have to go back to beginner's mind when you write a new genre and that would be true so for example I said I'm trying to I'm not trying I am not try do I am writing a travel memoir and I'm trying to learn now about writing memoir which again it is 
technically non-fiction but it's you know it's it's its own genre and I'm yeah. learning how to write that and so it's almost like I'm back at the bottom of the ladder again and that's how you have to think about fiction or people listening it's what you have to think about uh, I mean for example if you write if you're an academic writer so I co-wrote um uh, the healthy author the healthy writer with a medical doctor very very accomplished uh, medical writer I had to edit him so much to cut out his passive voice for a start, but also yeah. to try and bring his thoughts and opinions into his writing to try and bring it alive because mm. the type of writing he did didn't equate to the type of writing we needed to write. And it's the same with fiction and nonfiction. You have to think that you're starting again. And so you actually do have to read books. You have to um do courses you have to uh learn these things you have to work with a different editor you i literally think i mean yes you have to write you have to keep writing but you there are lots of things you have to learn when you do fiction that you don't need to know as a non-fiction writer and non-fiction is a lot easier sorry <laughs> <laughs> it is it's a lot easier and fiction is um very rewarding but it's it's much more difficult I think to find where you're going with it um what you want to do with it what the point is and all the different variants of it and and it's funny because I have a book called how to write nonfiction, and I've got 90,000 words of a draft of how to write a novel <laughs> and every time I look at it I go this is too big a question this is too big whereas with non-fiction it was like okay and it's quite a chunky book but I'm like I'm really happy that that if you go through it, you'll be able to write a nonfiction book. Whereas with this one, I'm like, goodness me, you could, you, it's a craft that you learn for a lifetime. So what I would say to you in terms of a tip is uh, you need to put aside time for that fiction side of you and say, okay, I'm not going to put pressure on it. I'm just going to say, all right. So once a week, I'll set aside a couple of hours and this week um, I'll read a book on dialogue and maybe noodle around with some dialogue or, uh, you know, I'm going to think of a One thing I really like doing is picking a film that I really like and kind of deconstructing why I like it, why it works, why the fictional story was so effective, you know, that kind of thing. That's a great tip. breaking down other novels is really useful. Mm -hmm. um, going actually going chapter by chapter, what happens, what point of view is it? How does the dialogue work? How do they start the chapter, end the chapter, all of that kind of thing? Actually, I recommend masterclass.com. Have you done any of their courses? Yeah, I've um, I've done Neil Gaiman's actually. Uh, okay, so the one I highly recommend is James Patterson's. Uh, okay. That is excellent even if you don't like James Patterson's writing he understands I mean the man understands story he's yeah. he really really does and it's a very good course uh, Dan Brown's is also good um I didn't I mean I like Neil Gaiman but I didn't think his course was very useful compared to the other ones um mm -hmm. yeah. also doing the more screenwriting stuff I enjoyed Shonda Rhimes for example who obviously produces um Grey's Anatomy and Bridgerton yep. Yep. <laughs> so anyway I could go on forever but um I just think that for someone like you who's an expert in one kind of writing you just have to let it go and kind of start again <laughs> and learn something new that's uh, that's super helpful thank you because I kind of I kind of I, I was aware of that like actually doing it is is different but those tips like giving me somewhere to or giving people somewhere to start with with the um you know deconstructing novels deconstructing films doing a you know those recommendations for the masterclasses thank you for that um I am going to go and dig into that that's super thank you Joanne <laughs> no generous. worries I mean that James Patterson one I uh, I've actually been through that a number of times because I find it it's quite concise, but he is, he's a, just a master. I mean, there's a reason he is the most highly paid author in the world. Yeah. And many literary people will say, oh, he's James Patterson. He's so terrible. It's like, yeah, yeah, but he makes, what, a couple of hundred million a year. And, um, know. you know, I, I mean, dude knows what he's doing. <laughs> that always makes me laugh because I have, I, I don't even want to say he's one of my guilty pleasures. I just like his books. I've read, I've read loads of them and I'm not like a massive thriller reader, but he is, it's just like, he knows how to tell a story. It's like, it doesn't yes. really matter how fancy the writing is. It's like, does it grip you from start to finish? Yes. Then he's won. 
Exactly. Exactly. Well, there you go. If you're already reading his books, then I think you'll enjoy his course because it gives. And he's a plotter. I mean, I'm a discovery writer, which means I can't really plot in advance, but I learned a lot from from that. Um, yeah. So anyway, have a look at that, and hopefully, and people listening, if if you don't know, it's very cheap masterclass. Yeah. Um, they're in- incredibly cheap for what they are, and and f- what I did was just get the annual pass for one year, and you just get access to everything, <laughs> which is just incredible. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's a marvelous, um, a marvelous service. Masterclass is. Yeah. Thank you for that. <laughs> Um, okay, so I there are so, I've, honestly I've written down so many notes that I'm just like not going to have time to ask you about. But I've got a couple a couple more. Um, can you can you tell us a little bit? And I know this is a thing you're working on. So if the answer is no, that's cool. But can you tell us a little bit about your travel memoir that you're working on? Because that sounds it sounds like you've done a lot of traveling, and I'm excited about that happening. I'm going to be one of the first people to to buy it and read it. So can you tell us a bit? Oh, about that? thank you. Yeah, well, I've wanted to write. A travel memoir for a long time but I don't know what it looks like and this I mean you understand structure right and not there's different structures of a non-fiction book for example uh, and you have to take the reader on a journey from start to finish and travel memoir has a number of different types or structures and I had really thought that the only structure well most of the best-selling structured travel memoirs, um, things like Eat, Pray, Love, for example. Oh, my life is falling apart. I'm so miserable. Everything's lost. I go on a journey and thus I am changed by the end and I'm happy and I fall in love, whatever. Or Wild by Cheryl Strayed. My life is falling apart. It's terrible. I go on a really long walk and miraculously I meet the man of my, my dreams and I'm saved. <laughs> so I mean, not literally, you know, or um, Rugged Man Goes Across Desert or Up Mountain or whatever. <laughs> and <laughs> I've just been like, no, nah, it's not me. It's not me. It's not me. And then in the last couple of years, I think as I've, matured in my writing as well and I think I haven't been able to trust that I could even write memoir because it's quite a different very personal way of writing and I write personal things but often they're through the voice of my characters so you don't know whether it's really me or whether I made it up (laughs) Um, but with with this travel memoir what I've discovered is that there are other forms um so on my books and travel podcast recently I interviewed my friend um Toby Neal who has a memoir called Open Road and it's it's an A to B travel story and but she's happily married she and her husband go across America's national park so it's got that travel element but then she's got these vignettes where she talks about her memories of growing up in Hawaii and other things um more personal things and so what I've noted that way and I've because I've been interviewing people on my books and travel show uh, I've been sort of reading all these different types of memoirs and discovered that this this would work for me so what I'm doing is going to have an A to B one big journey and then I'm going to have these vignettes hanging off it and so I guess for me it's something I I've got a lot of vignettes from my life and from my travels but I didn't want to write one travel book about one trip Mm. so I've just been reading around a lot of that. And that would be another tip for people. That's why you need to break down books and you have to understand the structure of a book in order to see the potential of where your book is going. So if you want to write um, an award-winning, you know, massive best-selling romance, then spend some time with Nora Roberts' books, uh, you know, and some of the indie authors who write romance and whatever genre you want to write go through that and figure out what they're doing and what works and what doesn't work and and then you'll be able to see the future for your book and kind of hang it together so I just I just feel like it's coming around to a time in my life I'm also um, 46 (laughs) so I feel like in your 40s in your late 40s you're meant to start writing memoir that's what happens (laughs) I love that it's like okay 46 time to write the memoir how to write the memoir (laughs) <laughs> you you hit that point in your life when well especially in a pandemic you're just like oh okay <laughs> I'm gonna write this now also I think with the pandemic uh, there's a few books that have been in my head that I want to write and I'm like I'm not ready I'm not ready another one is called the shadow book it's a working title about writing from the dark side of ourselves and 
all these things I've thought in the last 18 months, well, you know, I mean, and I'm, as you know, I'm recovering from COVID. I, I got, I got it. And uh, it was like, well, if I die, I, I will be really pissed off that I haven't written these books. <laughs> so I really need to get on with it because time seems to just fly by. <laughs> And I love that message. I've got um, a client that I'm working with at the moment and she talks a lot about deathbed you and, you know, do the thing, do the thing now, because, you know, what, what's deathbed you going to think if you haven't done them by the time, you know, by the time you're lying there. And so I think maybe, you know, the pandemic has made a lot of people, it certainly made me reevaluate what I was doing and I'm happier now for it. I feel very lucky and privileged that that's, that's the case, but, but yeah. It's, it's, well, um, then- what about your novel or your fiction? Is that something you would, on your deathbed, you'd be like, oh, I wish I'd written that? Totally, yeah. I'm going to take my own advice at some point. Um, but, <laughs> um, but no, in, in all seriousness, I'm actually starting an MA in creative writing later this year. So that is that was that was me getting serious about not just getting better at um, the craft of nonfiction and so that I can help, you know, help my clients better, but also because I wanted to be able to use that to, to write the damn novel. So... Mm. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, I, I love the idea of deathbed, deathbed you and doing the thing that you want to do before it's too late. So yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Well, I hope I can get back to traveling at some point, <laughs> but, um, oh, all, yeah. oh, I would also say on the, um, the MA in creative writing, a lot of people who do those courses are kind of encouraged to write genres that are in quotation marks acceptable to traditional publishers. And that might not be true of your course, but if people listening, I, I think, one of the dangers of those courses is writing things you think you should write as opposed to things that you actually love. And so, again, this is about looking at your bookshelf, whether it's digital or physical or both, and going, OK, what books do I actually read? Yeah. <laughs> and so I should write the books that I love to read so if you if you read James Patterson then writing a book like James Patterson is possibly your best way to success instead of like my mum said oh why don't I write something like Hilary Mantel and I'm like don't be ridiculous I don't write like Hilary Mantel um so that's the thing that's the important thing what whatever course you do or, or writers group or whatever make sure the people you surround yourself with are accepting of whatever you want to write for example the top selling genre in the whole world is romance and yet it's just not considered so acceptable uh, in many circles it's funny isn't it because yeah I think that that's also really good advice for anyone um, listening and for, for me as well which is which is fantastic thank you to, to write what you want to write I, I hope I'm beyond the beyond the point of being pushed into boxes by other people now but I will definitely keep that in mind um have a look at my shelves and and bang the drum for fantasy and sci-fi which is one of my big things so big big Terry Pratchett fan here so <laughs> oh there you go yeah well that's great um okay so I could carry on asking you questions all day but I'm gonna have to not do that because we've, we've both got other things to do and my podcast people will yell at me um but I've, I've just got two more questions one that I always finish with if you could leave listeners with one piece of writing advice that um works for you what would you say to them yeah so coming back to what I said about making time it's use your calendar and if you don't use a calendar use google calendar or whatever on your phone or whatever device you have actually schedule the time to write and then turn up for that appointment with yourself as if you know you and I turned up to this appointment because we had made an appointment and so we wanted to do it and many people seem to say oh you know I just I don't have time to write well it's like well you need to schedule it like this as if it was someone else that you're turning up for um you know for you it's turning up for that meeting with Neil Gaiman you know you're gonna turn up for that (laughs) you're not gonna just blow it off because you have something like Netflix to watch or the washing up to do you're going to do it and so I, it's it's using your calendar to look at your life, schedule that time and then get up or do whatever you have to do to make that appointment as if it was another person, as if it's your muse, basically. You have to turn up for it. So that's my tip. And it works for me. It's how I pretty much run my writing life. I schedule the whole thing. <laughs> Thank you. I uh, You can't see me, but I am here kind of air clapping because um yeah that is something that I do as well it was like schedule the damn time and make the make the room do the do the writing so thank you for that um and finally where can we find out more about you please 
Yes, well, since this is a podcast, uh, you could search your podcast app for The Creative Pen, uh, pen with a double N, and that's my podcast for writers or books and travel is my podcast um, if you like travel and books. <laughs> that one will be for you uh, of course all my books fiction and non-fiction are on all the usual places and my main website is thecreativepen.com pen with a double n so that's a good place to start have and I'm just going to drop in on the end of that that absolutely go and check out Joanna's website because it is the most incredible resource for writers um, you've just got so much useful stuff on there and it's really handily categorized and so yeah I, I think your, your website is probably one of the, the first stops that I make and I'm like, oh, I have a question. I bet John has the answer to it. Um, it's, it's just super useful. Um, so, oh, yeah. thank you. Thank you. For that. Well, actually, there is, um, and if, if people do go on my website, the, the problem with having been doing this for so long is there is a lot of information there. So I have tried to organise it. There's also a Google search bar on the Start Here page. So you can just put that, put something in there and something will come up. <laughs> Absolutely. And I've also found that if you haven't actually got um, an article on it yourself, you always know where to point people as well, which is really, really helpful. So um, thank you for that. Um, oh, no worries. Joanna, this has been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for um, spending the time with us today and talking to us about all of the, all of the things. Um, like I said, I would I've got so many other questions. I'm probably going to bug you for another interview at some point when your when your new travel memoir is out. Um, we'll get you back on and talk about that if you'd be willing. Um, but for now, thank you so much. Oh, well, thanks for having me, Vicky. And you're allowed to invite me back once you've done that novel. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. Or at least a, at least a short story. Let's go yeah. there. Finish something fiction wise. There's my challenge to you and all your listeners have heard it. Oh my gosh. Okay. That is actually, yeah. I mean, that's the reason I wrote my first book was I stood up in front of a room full of people and said I was gonna, so I had to do it. So, okay. I will, I will invite you back when I have written some fiction. Excellent. All right. <laughs> well, thanks for having me. That was great. You're so welcome. So that was my interview with Joanna Penn. I hope you enjoyed listening to it as much as I enjoyed chat chatting to her. Joanna, thank you again so much. It's a real pleasure to have you on the show. Um, looking forward to getting you back on um, at some point when you have written your travel memoir. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. And for all of my listeners, thanks for tuning in as usual. Um, I have at the moment a really cool, if you're if you're wanting to write your book, if you've been inspired by Joanna's story um, and you're wanting to write your own book, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, although obviously I specialize in nonfiction, um, I've actually got a bundle of templates uh, that I've created that you can purchase from my website moxiebooks.co.uk forward slash start your book templates um, the link is in the show notes below um, and yeah I, I just created them because I know how difficult it is to get started you have this great idea and you're like oh what am I going to do with it and you sit down to write and everything just disappears out of your head so um, those templates are there for you to use uh, I will be back same time next week with Joe. And in the meantime, have a fabulous week. And uh, thank you very much for your for giving us your time for spending time with us on this podcast. Uh, thank you to Podfly for all of your hard work. Thank you to Harriet for being just magnificent. I could not get through the day without you. Um, just thank you. I'll see you soon. Thanks for listening. You can find links and show notes on the website at moxiebooks.co.uk forward slash podcast where you can also sign up for the best daily emails in the multiverse and find loads of free resources to help you write your book. We'll be back the same time next week with more tales from the book writing trenches and the latest on what the tiny sheeps have been up to. Mm -hmm.